Hi, everyone. Um, got a lot to go over today, um, but only 20 minutes to do so. Um, I'm going to try to, in this time, give you a lot of things to supplementally read on instead of digging into it deep. Uh, and instead, try to provide a lot of inspiration and ideas and high level direction where I think um, blockchain economics is going to go in the next era. Um, a little bit about me is that I simply believe that all the ex industry's existing playbooks on tokenomics are just garbage. Um, they trend towards all of the wrong types of incentives. And you guys have heard of these narratives before, things, uh, crazes that are um, exemplified by things like the ICO, IEO, IDO eras we've been through before, how this caters toward all the types of adverse selection to bring on mercenary and grifter type users uh, to these platforms um, in a fake form of, of community bootstrapping. Um, and even worse, that when, when the time comes that the markets are unstable, you see treasuries wiped out pretty much overnight because 90% of them, 90% uh, of the projects have been holding their treasuries largely in their own tokens. And so um, I want to address the, like, go over really some red flags uh, that any token economist might tell you out there and just things to watch out for. And I'm totally open to discussion, but I hope that perhaps past this year we can do away with some what I would call largely fantastical myths about raising tokens, things you might have heard of, uh, X, Y, Z to earn, or multiple dual token models, things of this sort, um, or the idea that you should list and go price discoverable um, so that you can uh, give to your community. Um, while I can see some good intentions in a lot of these previous strategies, none of them are backed by any sound financial history or economic theory. So that brings me to a very big point that a lot of projects and blockchains are completely neglecting, which is the fact that most blockchains and projects are entirely terribly monetized. And so here's a very simple theory, right? If in the venture backable contingent of blockchain projects, um, if we want to build globally scalable infrastructure, we need to be able to do a, lot, a few things, right? We need to be able to charge surplus value. We need to be able to scale that globally. And we, and, and we also need to be able to price discriminatorily based off of our customers that are willing to pay more for higher service. And here's the ugly, ugly reality that shows how far behind we are, right? Electricity, telecom, internet, cloud compute. All of these charge monthly utility bills in excess of their cost of service. And for me, at least, and I would imagine to most common sense people, that until blockchains are able to do the same, we're just going to remain VC subsidized, retail pumped R&D. And so um, a typical thing you might hear uh, in the TradFi world, as it's called now, is this idea that blue chip tech stocks are traded on rationalized multiples, meaning if you look at their EBITDA, 12 month forward revenue, things of this sort, and then some stock trader or Wall Street throws on a 5 to 10x multiple in good times, there's enough consensus to back them. Now, what if I told you that, and you probably all can see this yourselves, but something we don't talk about, like a, like a subject we're avoiding in therapy, which is that blue chip tokens are traded at delusional multiples. Um, just running the numbers on a few of the top protocols out there, we see a consistent, um, even in times like now, 100x uh, multiple to a generous projection of 10-year forward fees collected. Um, and so he here's, here's, a, here's the main proposition because I've had good times and bad times in crypto as well. Um, the nihilistic di disclaimer here is that if your token is lucky enough to get to 100x uh, multiple in a deeply public market, I'm happy to make money off of you. But the wholesome suggestion for myself as well is can we prepare for the eventuality where we have to trade at one to two, to digit, one to two digit multiples on our fees collected uh, as opposed to these triple digits. Um, and so that's how I'm going to introduce a new era, which is going to tackle a few problems in this stack. Um, at Republic Crypto, I've defined sort of three main areas uh, of focus that pertain to today's, today's talk. The first and foremost is monetization, second is utility design, and the last is how, that, how those implicate very different motions on the phasing and timeline uh, of most protocols, uh, new, especially new protocols uh, that we're going to be building. For this talk, I'm going to focus particularly on monetization. 
So the, uh, one of the biggest uh, theses that we proposed um, uh, last year was the idea of super tokens, or, or in a more uh, uh, infrastructural context, vertically integrated super chains. And what this means is that, similar to what Avalanche is doing today, you're not just the infrastructure provider of a node network, but you're also building the application, the key application, the, the hub that is the wallet, that is the one-stop shop for you to plug into any other subnet and buy any NFT, trade any token. And to be able to consolidate that for the user is what's going to allow us to have the scale of companies out there that you, that you sure know of, WeChat, Facebook, Alibaba, Rappi, and Latam. Um, and these type of super app scales is what we're going to need to uh, uh, um, actually build towards instead of asking every developer and their summer intern to raise another venture-backed token project. Um, and, by, and, my, and by this sort of, if you will, euthanization of more and more uh, fodder shit coins, I do believe we're going to have more cohesive products that will be valued uh, uh, to in what appears to be a highly consolidated uh, and aligned fashion. Um, and one of the key blockchain economic uh, mechanisms that facilitates this is this idea that every single app built on top of the infrastructure provider must pay their rent to the infrastructure provider below. One mechanism that's ongoing in research for us, um, oh, and by the way, if you want to read more about all that, uh, please visit um, our um, uh, please visit our articles that I have linked here um, on 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 our website about the super token thesis that's dedicated to different uh, portions from the original thesis to on chain M and A's as well as how to build out those types of applications yourself. Right. So on chain gas subscriptions. Um, this is one ongoing thing that we're working on. Um, and overall, the main idea here is we're going to look back in time and think, wow, uh, we charged users on a per transaction basis through a volatile priced currency in order to run this infrastructure. And we're going to look like cavemen to those 10 years in the future of this. The very simple but surely not technically trivial answer to this is how can we bring gas subscriptions uh, to be as easy to be paid like a phone bill, right? I don't care about how LTE or 5G or 3G speeds work. All I care when I negotiate or when I'm sold by T-Mobile is I know I'm getting unlimited data and I don't care how many people I'm cutting in front of and I want to see the price tag it's going to take me to get that space. And this is why it's so important, I believe, to commoditize block space and, pri and premium bandwidth uh, on blockchains. Uh, and by doing this, we'll finally have recurring revenues that all the larger tech investors can understand as recurring cash flows and therefore justify what I hope will look like tech-esque valuations for blockchains in the future. You know, from there, this uh, begs the question additionally of do all of these fixed cap tokens need to be used as uh, currencies per se? And the answer for me is absolutely not. Um, if you talk with especially any of the uh, uh, folks around the world in LATAM, Europe, Asia, especially Southeast Asia, no one cares about volatile um, altcoins. They want ways to store their money and they want potentially in the application layer ways to use that money after it is being stored in this new internet bank, if you will. And so the importance of being able to price our goods and services in a reference currency like USD is of utmost importance and the ability then to spend in a USD paid currency, no matter the qualms and my criticisms on things like USDC or USDT, we can't allow those to paralyze our, our, our methods of bringing in revenue to the mothership of these protocols. One major way and then the next question naturally is, even if we do successfully accomplish some of these new monetization methods, how do we tether them back to the token price in a mechanistic way when we have for years psychologically conditioned uh, users and buyers to, to use this sort of postmodern speculation uh, on token prices? Um, and that's something here in, at Republic Crypto that we are calling proxy prices and accordingly uh, proxy price funds. 
you know, one of the main items here is that tokens are released prior to revenue, prior to any product market fit, prior to any scale, right? And what does that actually mean for users at the beginning of these projects, um, life cycle, and how they're going to grow that, right? This is a huge problem of adverse selection that brings, like I said in the first slides, all the worst types of users to your economy. Second is this buyback and burn model, which is something that I tirelessly rip on um, in the industry because it has this ridiculous notion uh, that many, I'm sure, know and probably would agree of efficient market theory. Um, and even though that is certainly what I was taught in school, most people um, with, a, with a good head on their shoulders know that something as buy back and burn is not efficiently reflected in the market. And so um, it's both, and in addition to that, it causes a real conflict in how companies are using their preciously raised funds, and, ver and, and in some cases revenue and profit, to manipulate their own basically stock or token price instead of focusing on building the next product feature or the next product in their stack. Um, and so with this in mind, we've built something called um, a proxy price fund. And the main idea here is the following. Um, users are not yet conditioned to understand the fundamentals or the uh, uh, value that is driven to any current token project. And so a very rudimentary idea of a proxy price fund is simply the total amount of fees ever made by the protocol divided by the amount of tokens emitted in that same time period. And while you might, mo might, most of you might think to the table I pointed earlier, uh, earlier at and suggest, oh, then the proxy price of a lot of tokens we know, because the fees are negligible, is going, to cr is going to give the impression that all of our tokens are worthless. I agree, and that is the biggest problem. And so with the proxy price fund, I'm encouraging a totally new playbook in which protocols start calculating these proxy prices um, at a mainnet stage, but avoid price discovery. And the way this works is um, by an incentivization model that we have called the proxy price fund here, where um, once there is a proxy price calculated by this smart contract fund, there is a price taking uh, incentive here to ask the community um, who, uh, who agrees with this proxy price? Is it fair? Um, if I choose to create a new business with you all, and I tell you that equity in the business is valued as our, on a basis of our revenue, but you are only getting a share of my profits, which is net, obviously, of costs, then you're going to dispute that the equity in my business is not based off of the revenue, it is actually based off of the profits that we make, because that is what you're realizing. And so who are the new owners? of protocols, right? For the sake of blockchain, for the conversation of blockchains, it is node validators. And so let's think about the node validators equation, right? After inflationary rewards eventually leak out, what is left in that pie to split to these new partial owners, uh, uh, um, part, part owners of this protocol? Um, and what this proxy price fund does is say, if you get into this system, at this price, which is calculated by, let's say, our revenues over our tokens emitted, this is a rough reflection of what the money you're going to make by putting your tokens to work. The key aspect of the proxy price fund here is that it does not allow for any, just anybody to sell. Rather, it's a novel concept where only existing validators can sell their tokens uh, subject to additional parameters, and that the only people that will be interested in getting into the system again, this is all pre-price discovery, will, which should be naturally incentivized to put those tokens to work, not simply to hold them. And um, you know, later down the line, when projects build up, or if you will, handhold that proxy price up to a certain point, then they can decide to actually allow these validators, these owners, to then redeem those tokens at the proxy price. Now, um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions here on, hey, what happens when we do list? Can this exist when the token is already listed and priced on a market? Absolutely. Um, and this is pretty much the end of the presentation where I want to gather questions um, about how this proxy price is going to respond and relate and interact with market prices. Um, 
And so for any of you who want to venture on this new playbook um, that we're building, I highly encourage you to reach out to us, but I'm also at this point uh, looking for questions uh, on the topic, um, whether it was on an earlier slide or on the proxy price fund um, especially. Who here is building a token project? What's your project about? Can you speak up a little bit? And so what does your token do? So and in this case, when you have um, the protocols, is, is, is this its own chain or is this an application? It's an application. Got it. And so for this application, um, who is entitled to the distributions um, or the, the profits that you seem to be sharing from the token? Got it. And do you have any um, potential concerns that this profit distribution might be seen quite literally as a, as a security as a result of these profit distributions? I want to point out actually a very strong um, monetization method that we are working on as, a, a, as an extension of this idea, right? The biggest or the reason why my job exists, why tokenomics exists right now, is because we cannot create simple mimics of equity on chain due to regulations primarily, right? We can't simply uh, distribute profits to holders because it is cash flow earned on the basis of somebody else's labor. But what if we change this, the last clause of that sentence? What if it is cash flow simply earned on the basis of your own labor, right? And so the way that we work on projects quite a bit, if I rewind, um, is in these vertical super chains. Um, and the idea here is anybody holding the token doesn't get shit. You, in order to earn cash flow in this system, you must put the token to work. Anybody here run a node for Avalanche, Bitcoin, any, or Ethereum? That's not, it was, it's not easy to set up, and especially when the protocols upgrade and you need to think about expanding into different, uh, uh, expanding into different chains, this is non-trivial work. And so it is the opinion of ourselves and some of our clients and their legal counsels that as long as you can justify that the compensation, whether in tokens or in stable coins, is a direct form of compensation, then you can avoid this idea that you are, that you are transacting or issuing out uh, a type of security. And so in many models that we work on, we simply say that all financial gains associated with the ownership of tokens um, only comes through direct compens uh, compensation, as we do not believe that the securities and regulations can come after employment um, um, when it's something that is the backbone uh, of our economy. Please. How do you apply that rule for stakers who stake their coin to a validator? So they're not doing the work. If, uh, granted, they're putting their tokens to work, but somebody else is validating. I would, yeah, so when you speak about delegation is how I would term that idea. Um, it's, I simply see it as a much less um, important form of work meaning that its compensation should be probably priced and compensated accordingly. Um, and it's, if you ask people on my team, they believe that delegators simply shouldn't earn anything. But I do believe that in DPOS systems, delegators play an important role in bootstrapping the liquidity and total value managed or staked uh, in a protocol. Um, and so, especially in the early days, when pe not everybody can figure out how to run a node, I do believe there is some portion of, um, of value brought by those that delegate, but I, as not a lawyer, would not 
uh, recommend or make an argument that it is a direct form of compensation, which is why in our proxy price model, we largely focus on those that actually run the nodes as opposed to just those that delegate or stake. The key thing here is that every time you dilute your token by giving it to somebody who's not going to contribute anything back to your protocol, you're already driving its price down. Um, the key item here is that not everybody needs to be a partial owner. What we need more than partial owners is people that are actually going to pay for these services, um, which is, in my view, something that we have largely lacked um, in the industry broadly. And um, that's pretty much, thank you for much, everyone for attending and I'm um, looking forward to speaking to any of you personally about your projects and um, venturing on this new venture together into the next era of tokenomics.